I uh, just want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to give an update on scale in the Eastern region um, to start it off with. For those of you who weren't already aware of this, we have gone through a bit of a name change. Uh, we uh, are now called Rainbow Ecoscience, um, previously Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. We, uh, we did the name change to kind of capture how we've evolved the way we serve and support companies, municipalities, and organizations uh, throughout the years. And we wanted to make this name change so that we didn't lose the legacy of our company from the last 25 years. Uh, in addition to that, Rainbow Ecoscience is awful a lot easier to say than Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement. So I'm happy for that. Um, regardless, you will see this change reflected uh, in all areas of our company moving forwards. Quick safety brief uh, before we get started. Please check your surroundings if you're sitting at home or at your office. Check around if you have any trip hazards. Uh, fortunately for most of us on the East Coast, we have beautiful weather today. Um, but if you are elsewhere where you may have inclement weather, please be aware of that. If you are in your vehicle watching this, please make sure you are parked in a safe location. My name is Mark Ware. I'm an arborologist uh, based in the Northeast. Uh, my contact information is there as well. The, if you've never heard of an arborologist, there's an excellent reason for that. And that's because it is a made up term. Uh, it is an in-house term. So unless you work for Rainbow, um, you don't get to be an arborologist, sorry. But what that means is um, the way I, I serve you is with training and education on plant health care protocols, provide technical support and training in the field uh, over the phone, through text message, um, as well as, as uh, plant health care education. My background, I have about eight years with a national tree care company previous to this, doing everything from general tree work, utility forestry, uh, but primarily plant health care. Uh, I graduated from William, Williamson College of the Trades in 2014 with an educational background in landscape construction and ornamental horticulture. A little bit of housekeeping uh, real quick. If you have questions that come up during Mike's presentation, please type them into the Q&A box, uh, which is the one all the way on the right there. Uh, it's easier to keep track of for us and that way we don't accidentally miss your question at the end. We will answer all the questions at the end. Um, and so just as, you come, as they come up, just type them in there and we'll address them. This webinar is being recorded and there will be a link that's sent out afterwards. Uh, additionally, this webinar will be worth one ISA CEU. And if you did not already enter your ISA certification number and information during registration, you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A box right now. That way we make sure we have all of your information. Additionally, Patrick Anderson will be in the background addressing any technical concerns that may arise, whether there are sound issues or video issues. Please type those concerns as well into the Q&A box and Patrick will give you a hand figuring all of that out. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Mike Raup. Mike is a professor at the University of Maryland. He is a widely published uh, and regular guest on television and radio, author of two websites, bugoftheweek.com and his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash bugoftheweek. These feature, uh, these reach thousands of viewers weekly in more than 200 countries around the world. His most recent book, 26 Things That Bug Me, introduces youngsters to the wonders of insects and natural history while managing insects and mites on woody landscape plants is a standard for the arboriculture industry. And with that, Mike, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can take it away. Hey, thanks a lot, Mark. And uh, first of all, I wanna thank Mark and Patrick for inviting me to uh, tell you some bug stories today, share some information on scale insects. Always, uh, you know, I, I gotta tell you, gang, I really, uh, really kind of hate the scales. Uh, they're on my, my list of least favorite uh, insects in the landscape because they can be such a pain in the neck to get rid of. So today, what I'll try to do is share some information. We're gonna go over the biology of the major scale groups that we find here in the Northeast. 
Uh, Mark, would you give me a heads up if the share screen worked correctly and everybody is seeing my title slide? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, gang. And uh, as Mark said, please uh, feel free to uh, put your question to, in the question box. Uh, Mark, if it's okay with you, maybe at about the halfway point, uh, we can take a break and uh, let people stand up, stretch their legs and answer a couple questions before we dive in and finish up the second half. So I know those questions are important and I wanna make sure we get to them. So we'll try to hit those perhaps at a midway point. Give everybody a chance to get up. It's a beautiful day. I wish I was outside right now, but hey, here we are. Let's learn about scale insects. These guys belong to a group of insects, which we know as the Hemiptera, the half-winged insects. Uh, these are very common. Some of our other groups we call the true bugs. This would include things like bed bugs or brown marmorated stink bugs or honey locust plant bug. We have what we call the Echinoranca. Uh, these include things like leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, cicadas, which uh, the guys here in the Mid-Atlantic had a dose of last year. But today we're going to talk about this nasty group called the Sternorenka, the longhorned um, bugs. This includes some of the most egregious pest groups we have, aphids, adelgids, white flies, psyllids, mealy bugs, and scales. But today we're going to focus on those scales. Now, there are several different types. You've probably seen many of these guys out in the field are mealy bugs, white flies, the armored scale insects, soft scales, and aphids. We're going to drill down on these two groups very heavily today, soft scales and armored scales, because frankly, I think these are the number one scale insects that we see in ornamental landscapes. The soft scales include or are what we call the coccidae. Common ones include things like magnolia scale, terrapin scale. Then we have the armored scales. These are the diaspitted scales, and they come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes. We have some that are round, like San Jose scale. Some that have these oyster shell shapes, like Japanese maple scale or oyster shell scale. And finally, these elongated covers. Uh, elongate hemlock scale, AKA Fiorinia hemlock scale, which you'll sometimes see. Mealybugs, the pseudococcids. Okay, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on those guys today. Unfortunately, we just don't have time, but they can be problematic, primarily more so in the South than here in the mid-Atlantic. We will briefly talk about the pit-making scales, the Asterolacaniidae, a uh, holly pit maker. There's also one that gets on oaks relatively commonly. I am going to spend a bit of time on these area coxin or felt scales, things like azalea bark scale, European elm scale, and the new kid on the block, that one that gets on crepe myrtle. Uh, we won't have time to do beach blight scale today, but that's another one that we're starting to see creep into our region. Hey, we'll do that one another time. And we'll talk very briefly about the gall-like scales, the kermesids that we often find on oak, golden oak scale. They tend to be minor problems in most situations here in the Northeast. Now, in terms of the life history of these various scale insects, basically we have what we call sexual divergence. That means the male scales are going to look very, very different from their counterparts to female. The male scale is gonna look very much like a small fly or a small gnat. It's gonna have wings. It's gonna have a very small body. The female scales, you know what those look like. You know, for our soft scales, uh, they're gonna be humped up. They're gonna be bulbous. Very, very different. They don't have wings. They tend to be sessile, meaning that they stay put once they hunker down. Whereas the males will fly, they're active and they fly to find the females. These guys basically molt several times. They have five first, five instars. Uh, the Im immature stages, of course, are called nymphs. Whereas these guys only have three immature stages which is really different. When we have these uh, ones that are very basically nymph-like or immature in their appearance, and with these lesser number of malts, we call them pietogenic, okay? So they look more like an immature insect than like an adult 
regular good looking adult insect, kind of quirky development in their life history. Now, our scales, as you know, in many of our sucking insects, including things like our woolly aphids, they're characterized by having abundant wax glands. And this is one of the key features when we talk about diagnostics. Whenever we see wax on a branch, we're thinking, boom, scale insects, sucking insect of some kind. So we have some that make this kind of, uh, I don't know, smooth wax, uh, the Indian wax scale, for example. We have others that have kind of a fluffy wax. And then we have those that have kind of a hard wax, like our armored scale. So different kinds of waxes for different scale insects. Let's talk briefly about their feeding habits. So with our soft scales, the coccidae, these guys are going to be phloem feeders. And gang, what's one indication that we have a sucking insect that's feeding on phloem? What goes along with this? It includes things like lanternflies. It's a little pop quiz. If you guys said honeydew, you got it. That's the clue. They're honeydew producers. They can feed on wood or on leaves. The other major group of key pest scale insects in our landscapes are the armored scales, the diaspidids. They feed on different tissues. They are not feeding on phloem. They are cell bursters. In other words, their beak goes in. We'll look at that more in just a minute. And you're not going to have honeydew when you have your armored scale. So two critical diagnostic features, honeydew, automatically I'm thinking soft scale, not armored scale. These tend to be relatively large as scales go, a quarter of an inch sometimes, maybe even a little bit bigger. They're round, they're convex, and when you're looking at this, you're actually looking at the scale insect, okay? It's, this is part of its body. We have others that make ovisacs, like the cottony camellia scale. And then we've got some that make this funny wax. Uh, it almost looks like chewing gum, all right? I'm, I'm not recommending, I have uh, tasted those. Nah, don't do that, not so good. It's really not like chewing gum. Okay, so when we flip over something like a barnacle scale or an Indian wax scale or Florida wax scale, what we're gonna see, oftentimes the body itself is red. We can see the wax traces. These white traces are where the wax glands produce the wax. And then they're loaded with eggs. And sometimes those eggs will be hatching and we'll see the little crawlers inside, okay? So this is actually the wax coating can't be removed from the body wall of the insect. Now, in terms of feeding, here's our soft scale. You can see, let's say a bark feeder like Magnolia scale. What it's gonna do, it's gonna drill down through the bark, through the underlying leaf tissue into the phloem elements, and it's gonna feed on nutrient and sugar rich phloem tissue. Okay, so that's where they're feeding. And that's why we're gonna have so much honeydew and resultant so much sooty mold. Now, where they're going to feed again in the leaf tissue, our soft scale may be resting next to the mid vein of the leaf. Let's say nymphs of Oaklatanium scale. They're gonna pierce that leaf surface that stylet, their mouth part, is going to go through the, the epidermal and palisade, palisade cells right into the vascular bundle. It's going to plug into your phloem tissue, and that's where they're going to imbibe the rich phloem sap. And again, these are going to be producing honeydew and sooty mold. Okay, now, excellent diagnostic clue. What color are leaves supposed to be? If you said green, excepting variegated cultivars, if you said green, you're right. What color is the bark of a tree supposed to be? If you said brown or gray, yeah, or paper bark white, yeah, you're also right. So when we see black leaves, when we see black bark, 
another diagnostic clue. And you can spot this at 30 miles an hour on a sugar maple going down the road. When I see black bark on a sugar maple, I say, boom, that thing has got either aphids or it's got soft scales on it. All right, so another good diagnostic clue. When densities get high enough, sometimes leaves will turn yellow, leaves will drop. You can get stunted growth and die back. And in certain cases, some populations over long periods of time can cause rather severe dieback and perhaps even death in certain small trees. Okay, we're gonna look for crawlers. All right, those little mobile stages, they're often feeding on sometimes like oaklacanium here, most of the time we think of the crawlers feeding on the undersurface of the leaf, there are exceptions. Oaklacanium, the crawlers are gonna be mostly on the top of the leaf right near the mid vein. We're gonna look for these big bloated bodies and we're gonna look for that honeydew and the accompanying sooty mold. Now sooty mold itself is non-pathogenic, but sometimes it can be so heavy that it actually reduces the photosynthetic capacity of the leaves on that tree and also on underlying vegetation. So this in and of itself doesn't kill the plant, but it does reduce its productivity, the sooty mold. We can do a flip test, and this is something I always do. Just because you see these bodies on a tree doesn't mean they're alive. All right, so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take my thumbnail and I'll run it down a branch and if it comes up juicy, it means those scales are probably alive. If it comes up dry, I'm gonna flip some of these covers over and see if I see eggs and nymphs underneath. And there can be a lot of eggs and nymphs. Look at this, one single female, there are probably a thousand eggs underneath that female. And this is why scale populations explode on trees if you're not uh, keeping an eye on things. They can um, develop very quickly. Let's talk about some common life cycles now. They're gonna vary in the stage that they overwinter. Some are gonna overwinter as nymphs, some are gonna be almost fully grown nymphs, some are gonna be very tiny nymphs. So we'll talk about that. The other thing we have to always think about is when are we gonna see crawlers? Because hey, crawlers are the number one stage of scale insects that we like to control. This is when they're gonna be most vulnerable to any kind of chemical intervention is when we have the crawlers. So that's important. Where the eggs are gonna be laid, are they gonna be uh, laid underneath the female? Most of the times they are. Some scale insects actually give live birth. Usually for our soft scales, we only have a single generation a year. Okay, so if we look at some of the common ones right now on our oak trees, the nymphs are overwintering on the bark. But as the season opens up, as we get into February, they're going to start feeding again. Once it warms up, they be can, can begin feeding. Once we get the bud break on the trees and the flow of flowing up and down the vascular system, hey, the nutrients are flowing, that's where they're gonna to begin to hump up and get big. The males are gonna appear, okay? They're gonna find the females and mate. Then we're gonna to begin to have the adult females underneath their covers with eggs. And finally, usually during May and June here in the mid-Atlantic, we're gonna see the active crawlers as those eggs hatch and they begin to move out onto the leaves to feed on the leaves during the summer. Now, these things aren't stupid, right? In the autumn, when it starts to get cold, when that tree is gonna get ready to drop its leaves, what are they gonna do? Hey, they're gonna head back to the bark of the tree to spend the winter. So this is the typical life cycle for things like our oak lacanium, our European fruit lacanium, our calico scale, cottony maple scale, um, terrapin scale, most of these soft scales are gonna behave this way. There are some exceptions. Things like tulip tree scale and uh, magnolia scale do something slightly different. Okay, so here's what we're gonna see. All right, we've got those females humped up. If you haven't seen the crawlers, you may not, you may not have recognized them. The crawlers tend to be kind of flattened. They're really flat, like a little pancake. They're translucent, so you can kind of see right through them. And they're usually hunkered down right near a leaf vein. Remember what I said about that mouth part. It's gonna go through that leaf tissue. It's gonna find its way into the phloem and they're gonna be feeding out there. And sometimes they're on the bottom of leaves, but sometimes like with oak they're mostly on the top of the leaves. 
Okay, this is a native insect. You know, people, a lot of people think that, you know, native insects, um, you know, all our pests are exotic insects. Not so. I mean, Oclocanium scales is a native insect on a native plant. We have a lot of problems here uh, with it in the mid-Atlantic region when it gets on oak trees, for example, down in DC, where we have a lot of oaks along Massachusetts Avenue. We've had continuing outbreaks of Oclocanium scale. Why? Because the natural enemies that normally control it in a more natural system, they can not simply hack the hard life in the city. So in some cases, we'll see uh, these scale insects outbreaking, particularly in deep urban habitats like the middles of cities, okay? Now, in terms of the biology, as I said, about one generation, well, certainly one generation a year, they overwinter as immatures. In the spring, the adults plump up, uh, they begin to lay eggs, the female leg her eggs, the eggs hatch, they crawl out and they begin to feed on the leaves. At the end of summer, it's time to beat it back to the bark to spend the winter. We can see leaf stunting, yellowing branch dieback, honeydew and sooty mold, a major problem in cities where you have businesses, you have cars, you've got restaurants underlying these oak trees. We get the heaviest sap flow, excuse me, heaviest honeydew production uh, during the periods of heavy slap, sap flow, which are going to be in the spring as those females are plumping up and beginning to feed and lay their eggs. Okay. Here's another one that's relatively common. I see this on Burford's all the time, uh, Cornutas. You know, you get these hollies with very, very dense canopies. <clears throat> it's really hard to get a horticultural oil or a safer soap or your pyrid proxifen, your proxite or whatever you're gonna use in that, in that leaf surface sometimes. So sometimes the populations get huge on holly. It also gets on taxis where it's called taxis scale. It's a soft scale. You'll see these egg masses. These are the egg cases. That's where the female is going to lay her eggs, the eggs that hatch and begin to feed on the leaf tissue. We're going to see a lot of city mold associated with these guys. Now this one, hey, I don't know about you, but when I first started working in landscapes, you know, some 40 years ago, you know, Indian wax scale and Florida wax scale and barnacle scale, rare, you know, just rare. It, the winters were simply too cold for those things to survive well. But as the climate is warming, I'm seeing these wax scales succeeding year round and becoming very, very problematic. Again, I see a lot of problems on hollies, uh, Ilex glabra, you know, the ink berries in particular. I've seen them wipe out ink berries in landscapes. And uh, again, uh, this is something I think more related to global change. They just survive better now. They're pretty cool. Uh, as I say, they, the females have this big waxy coat. They're going to lay eggs. The eggs are going to hatch in this first stage, not the first stage, but as they molt into the second and third instars, we're going to see this waxy border on them. And they look like a cameo, right? We call this the cameo stage, but that's basically the, the nymphal stage of this uh, wax scale. Very common, as I said, on Ilex. I'll see them on Euonymus boxwood, Pyracanthra, Pyracantha. I see them on Spirea too. All right, now we come to kind of an exception in the soft scale routine here. All right, the tulip tree scale and the magnolia scale do something a little bit different. All right, with these particular guys, we're going to see the females, let's start down here, the females basically beginning to hump up in late summer, August going into September. And in September and October, they're going to lay their eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch. And it's going to be the early instar nymphs that spend the winter. They're going to be with us from November to, to February again. When your magnolias, uh, your tulip trees begin to break bud in springtime, when the stellatas are beginning to blossom, that's when we're going to see them start to hump up. They're going to molt. 
They're going to develop through the summertime. We're going to have males anywhere from April to July, and we're going to have them mating mature females again, one generation a year. Now, you'll often see these very thick infestations. Part of the reason they can achieve these great numbers is there's often a very close relationship between these scales and ants. When I suspect that I've got, let's say, Sulangianas or Stellatas in a landscape, one of the first things I'm gonna do in the summertime, I'm gonna see if there's an ant trail going up the bowl of that tree. All you have to do is follow those ants up and through the branches. They're gonna take you right to where you can see those scale insects. Now, sometimes if you catch it early, you can simply, there, it might just be a half a dozen females on there. You can simply squash them. You can prune the branch. Sometimes it's very isolated and you can just eliminate the problem, boom, just like that. And remember, that's a billable item. You've solved that problem in a environmentally sustainable way without the use of pesticides. That still is a bill, billable item that you've solved that problem. Sometimes they get very heavy in trees and we're gonna to have to use some tools. We'll talk about those tools in just a few minutes. Okay, so we'll see them on, uh, again, tulip trees and many different kinds of magnolias. Now, what are some of those tools? Let's talk a little bit about this. We're gonna look for the visual signs of damage, crawlers and matures on leaves and twigs, adults in the spring. Also look for beneficial insects because there are gonna be some ladybugs that really put a beat down on these things and look for those ants. Sometimes we may have to get rid of the ants either with a localized treatment or an ant bait near the base of the tree to interrupt that protection. One of the things we absolutely know, a lot of people will see leaves turn yellow, the first response, we're gonna fertilize, wrong. The first thing always to do is to get rid of the pest. Once you've gotten rid of the pest, then if you need to fertilize, go ahead and do it. Because if you don't, that nitrogen's going straight through those plants, straight into the leaves, and the scales are gonna say, thanks a lot, that's great. In some cases, we can physically prune them out, um, oftentimes with white prunicola scale, we'll talk about that one in just a minute. We can just prune off the infested branches or mechanically remove them with water sprays. I've seen people use soft scrub bushes to take them off the plants. We also have a lot of good uh, scale material. So let's, let's talk about those for just a few minutes. I've already said sometimes what we'll need to do is try to get the ants of the plants first, get those ants off of there. Um, Parasitoids are really, really important in holding these populations down. There are many parasitic wasps that attack these things as well as predators. So if we can have flowers and things in our landscape nearby, that'll encourage those. Now, in terms of products, we have ones with the active ingredient pyreproxifen. It's found in proxite. It's found in distance. These are insect growth, growth regulators. They are really, really good. When I have tough scale problems, I'm going to go to a product with pyreproxifen in it like proxite. Uh, this is going to give us that good control we need of the crawler stage. So it's all going to be cued into the timing of those crawlers, putting these applications on. You can also put a beat down on them with your horticultural oils. Again, you might have to do a couple applications for those because sometimes that crawler emergence peak is you know, spread out over a couple of weeks. So you might have to do two sprays, let's say, to hit the, the early guys and maybe some guys a little bit later. We can use neonicotinoids, but I think most of you guys are aware now, guys and gals, that the neonics uh, basically can have some, a little bit of pushback, either spider mite outbreaks or on plants now that have pollinators on them, we're gonna try to be sure we don't have uh, things like uh, imidacloprid or dinotefuran. We know that dinotefuran also has a holdover effect now into the second season. So we have to be very, very careful uh, not to interfere with the pollinators. We've had some real blowback on that uh, when mistakes are made. 
Okay, so trees not in bloom. Another couple good materials, Lepitect. I have uh, arborists now when they have really tall trees, they can't get a wet spray up there or pyroproxifen. They're using acephate, okay? Systemic applications, Lepitec going up there. Acephate is a good scale material. Altus is one we use a lot in our landscapes down here and in our nursery. This carries the EPA reduced risk label, which gives us one more element of safety in terms of reducing impacts on beneficial insects, pollinators, and natural enemies of the scale insects. So Altus might be another tool that you have in your IPM toolbox. As I said before, there are predatory beetles, particularly those that are in the genus Skimnus. Here you can see tulip tree scale. That's not a mealybug gang. That is the larva of this beetle. And what that larva does, it sticks its head underneath the female. And as she's laying her eggs, it's just sitting in there gobbling up the eggs as she's laying eggs. So these guys can be really important. Keep an eye out. I've had situations where these ladybird beetles, the adults also feel it, feed on the scale insects, can really help reduce those populations. So keep an eye on these things. They're there to help you do your work. Let's talk about some efficacy studies. This is one on Florida wax scale. Uh, again, those waxy scales I talked about before done by Scott Ludwig. He found that the best material here was TriStar, acetamiprid, was giving excellent levels of control, just you know, really knocking these things out relative to even, even drenches of things like dinotefuran. So in this particular case, and again, you're, um, Acetamiprid is going to be a reduced risk material as well. Wax scale density on treated and untreated um, pyracantha. Uh, again, wax scales. Here are pre counts, here are the post counts. And in this case, uh, these particular trials were being done with um, dinotefuran. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're probably not going to be using dinotefuran on uh, pyrocantha anymore because we know that now that that dinotefuran has a carryover effect that's going to go into the second season. So I'm just saying that the, the Neonex uh, did give us very good control here. Some nice work done by Stanton Gill. Uh, here at University of Maryland found that the pyriproxifen, again, your proxite or distance, giving very good levels of control with, um, against uh, tulip tree scale on magnolias. Talus, mm, mediocre, orthene, not bad. We're going to skip over now. We're going to start to talk about the armored scales. Um, but I think what I'd like to do, again, Mark or Patrick, if it's all the same to you, are there any questions? Can I take a couple questions or two at this point in time on general scales or the soft scales before we move on to the armored scales? Sure. So uh, we had a question come in early. Um, what what is honeydew? So what I guess what exactly is honeydew? Um, yeah. What happens is to get enough nutrition. It's a great question to get enough nutrition. These scale insects and many of our other of our sucking insects have to take in vast quantities of liquid because they're simply, it's not nutrient rich enough to get all their nutrients. So what they do, they have a specialized gut and what it does is rapidly extract the good stuff, but then it squirts out the, the waste product. So honeydew is actually the waste product, the excrement of these sap feeding insects it tends to be very, very rich in sugar. Insects don't need that much sugar. All the sugar that's found in phloem, they need the nitrogen, right, to grow. So that sugary solution comes squirting at their rear end, and this is what causes, uh, forms the substrate for the sooty malt to grow. Good question. Excellent. Um, we touched, you touched on this a little bit, but um, are there any other predators of scale uh, yeah, there, there are tons of ladybird beetles uh, that eat them, several different species of skimness in different parts of the country. Uh, I've had reports of other uh, ladybird beetles, even things like, say, let's say, harmonia, 
Uh, but a lot of these ladybird beetles that kind of have this kind of mode, black backgrounds with red dots on their back are feeders on these uh, scale insects. Um, there are, there are parasitic wasps attack, that attack these as well. Lace wings, I think, will take uh, the nymphs, the immature stages before they get all humped up. So several different kinds of predators, great question. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, gang, realistically, they just can't keep up with that infestation. And we're going to have to go to our good tools like our py pyroproxifen, our whore oils, uh, in cases where we can use the neonics, uh, the neonics can be effective against these things. Excellent. Okay. Um, one more, uh, we'll do one more question, then okay. jump into uh, how do cold winter temperatures affect populations? Yeah, it's a great question. They're going to put a beat down. If we get, if we have a couple more super cold winters like we've had here, I would expect to see things maybe like the, those uh, wax scales, the uh, Florida wax scale, maybe get driven a little further south. We're also seeing penetration. I'm not, not going to talk about margarodids today, but there's another kind of scale insect called the margarodid. It includes things like the uh, cottony cushion scale, which is normally a pest of citrus in Florida and California, but I've seen it up here in Maryland and Pennsylvania on very mild winters. So some of these more southern scales, a cold winter can keep them bottled up in the south, but as our winters get warmer, I think we're going to see more of these southern scales up here. And a winter like this winter probably isn't cold enough. If the question is, did it get cold enough to put a beat down? I think it's unlikely. I think these things, it's simply, you know, once we start to get negatives, if we go negative five, negative 10, yeah, that's putting a beat down. But, you know, 12, 15, not so much probably. Good question. Shall we move on, Mark? Yeah, let's move on. We can address any others that come up at the end. Okay, great. So let's go over to now to our diaspitted scales. Um, you know, frankly, I think in many cases, these are even more difficult to control than our soft scales. These are little tiny guys. The insect is underneath that waxy cover. As they grow, they're going to make increasing kind of circles or elongate depositions of wax so the, the cover gets bigger and we can actually see rings in it. They feed by bursting cells and a lot of them are going to have more than one generation a year. Once, this, once the crawlers settle down, there'll be a period after the eggs hatch that the crawlers will move around and find new spots, but once they settle down, they're going to stay put except for the males, of course. A little bit of an easy comparison. Uh, these guys, you see their body, these guys are covered by wax. These are usually large, these are usually small and have a variety of shapes. They're not just round. Honeydew, yes, honeydew, no. Females produce tons and tons of eggs, up to a thousand. These guys, less than a hundred. The nymphs and the early females move around on plants, but these guys, once they molt uh, into the second instar, they're sessile. And as I said before, sometimes we have round ones like San Jose scale. Sometimes we have these oyster shell types like Japanese maple scale, and sometimes they're elongate like the Fiorinia hemlock scale. In terms of diagnosis, in parking lots, we'll often see dieback in the top of a uh, pin oak tree. You get up there and you look and you'll see it's loaded with uh, obscure scale. You'll also see yellowing on leaves like with euonymus scale. And if you look carefully on the bark of the tree, sometimes you'll see just thousands or tens of thousands of these scale insects lining the bark of the tree. Again, we can do a flip test. Here's the scale cover. Here's the female, that's one weird looking bug. No wings, no legs to speak of, you know, just this funny abdomen and a whole bunch of eggs underneath. We can also look for parasite holes. A lot of our scale insects are regulated by tiny parasitic wasps that attack them, okay? Here's what your crawlers look like, okay? This is pine needle scale. Again, these little clear, very, very small creatures that are gonna be feeding on vascular or bursting cells within the leaf. Uh, again, I talked about the different shapes. You should 
try to learn as much as you can. And sometimes you'll actually be able to see through the covers like on a elongate, elongate hemlock scale. This is a little bit too much, a little bit too complex here. I uh, just want you to know that this is what this scale insect looks like. Here's the female underneath. She lays her eggs, the eggs hatch into crawlers. They move around. Once they settle, they'll begin to make their covers. The females often will have round covers. The males sometimes will have this elongate cover. The males, as I said before, have wings and fly around. The females, no wings. They just hunker down and are pretty primitive looking creatures. Now, in terms of the ones that feed on leaves and needles, some of them will have two generations like Euonymus scale and elongate hemlock scale. Some of them will have only one like juniper scale and minute cypress scale. But some may have as many as three like white prunicola scale and white peach scale we could have three generations. So again, the timing is gonna be critical because remember you wanna hit those crawlers, that's your vulnerable stage. So you need to know what species it is you're dealing with and then how many generations so you can be looking to target those sprays for those particular crawlers, right? So that's part of the key here. As I said before, these guys are gonna hunker down they're gonna go in and they're gonna burst cells inside the leaves. They're not feeding on vascular like soft, they're gonna burst cells inside the leaves, okay? They don't make honeydew. So we can see things like euonymus scale, a heavy infestation, the leaves are gonna turn yellow. You're gonna find the females on the bottom side of the leaves. Uh, it also gets on pachysandra, but I see it most commonly on uh, the euonymus. Uh, there are some cultivars, Kyachovica is relatively resistant, okay, as are things like Euonymus elatus, we don't usually see it too much on that. Two generations a year, the females overwinter, so right now we have females, they're going to get going, we're going to see our first crop of crawlers in May, June, here in the mid-Atlantic, the second generation, August and September, okay. Now we know with these guys, again, as I said, it's going to be the fertilized adult females that overwinter, all right? So first generation, look for your crawlers in this window, second generation in that window. And they can get super heavy on the bark of trees. Uh, the females on the bark are really what's gonna cause the major problem is they bore down in there and they feed on tissues beneath the bark. You're gonna see yellow spots to uh, develop on the leaves that are gonna coalesce. There are beneficial insects. This is a chylocarus, okay, that feeds on it. Again, it's called the twice stab ladybird beetle. These ones are specialists on armored scales. They're a little bit different than the skimness we saw before. We don't have the white on the shoulders and on the head up here. These are pure black with two spots on the back. And you'll see these in the summertime as they feed on the crawlers. Again, we can use our good growth regulators and our horticultural oils. And if these scale insects are on green tissue and we're not concerned about pollinators, then we can come in with our neonicotinoid insecticides. If we're worried about pollinators, we can come with our Lepitec. And as I said before, we have Altus, that reduced risk uh, uh, compound, uh, the flupyratiferone is your active. Elongate hemlock scale, mostly on hemlock, but also on fir and spruce, two generations that overlap. We can have crawlers most of the time through the summer. There are parasitic wasps that attack and also the twice stab ladybird beetle. And I've also seen lacewing larvae feeding on the immature stages of elongate hemlock scale. They can get super heavy, we often see them in combination with hemlock woolly adelgid. I've had uh, landscapers uh, see hemlock leaves turning yellow. They think it's a nutrient problem. They begin to fertilize, right? Uh-uh. It's adelgids and elongate hemlock scale. When we fertilize plants, when these guys are on them, we're going to have more females with eggs, and those eggs each female is going to produce more eggs. So please don't fertilize these trees until you get the scales off of them. 
Then if you need to fertilize, that's okay, but you gotta get rid of your scale insect first. There's a little scale insect, it's called Maskell scale. I see it on Cryptomeria in particular, it's kind of a misnomer, but it'll feed right down here by these walls. And sometimes the densities can get huge. It's gonna cause this damage symptom that a lot of people think it's maybe winter injury or spider mites look very carefully right down here. You can see great numbers of these scale insects feeding on the scales, okay? The awls or the, the needles of these trees. Pine needle scale, two generations a year, look for your parasites, okay? It gets on uh, various kinds of um, pine trees. We have also have our bark feeding scale insects, obscure scale, you know, which I see all the time. Gloomy scale seems to be making a real run on maples, Japanese maple scale. Uh, so many plants coming out of nurseries now. Um, oh boy, you know, I see it a, an awful lot on Acer, on our maple trees, but it gets on a wide variety of trees, Bradford's. Um, Euonymus scale, 10 feet on the bark, and these two, again, we'll see them on privet, things like white prunicola scale on our privets, and we'll see white peat scale on our cherry trees, uh, three generations a year, and then, of course, on pyracantha and some of our um, rosaceous plants, apples, we'll see uh, San Jose scale. We've already talked about the feeding. Here's what your obscure scale looks like. It's usually on the two, three, four-year-old wood, green bark. Once the twigs get bigger, you may have little pockets, but most of the active uh, infestation is going on branches about the size of my, you know, my finger, my thumb, something like that, my pinky. So that's where you're gonna find the active ones, three or four-year-old wood. Gray covers, the crawlers are active in late June and July. This is a typical infestation. Again, your growth regulators are gonna work really well. Your proxite, your oils, things like that. Your natural enemies can be a real ally here as well. Gloomy scale. Maples in particular, I'm seeing more and more gloomy scale. I think this is probably primarily another case where you have a more Southern insect and with warmer weather, uh, warmer winters, we're seeing more and more here. It's got this roundish cover, one generation a year. Same thing, mostly on one to four year old wood, but boy, I'll tell you, I've seen the bark of recently installed maple trees, you know, three, four inches DBH, little, literally turn gray with gloomy scale, okay? Crawlers are active July through August. And this is what the densities can look like. You're gonna see die back in your canopy. You're gonna see very small leaves. So when you've got maples, especially in a corporate planting, in a mall, somewhere where you got moisture stress, you've got restricted root zone, you're starting to see thinning in the canopy, go and look at the bark of that tree. Make sure that you're not complicated by high infestation of gloomy scale. Something like this. You might think it's abiotic, but you take a close look, you're gonna see gloomy scale on here. There are wasps that attack this, but again, uh, you know, this is a situation where we're probably gonna to have to intervene. Okay. Japanese maple scale is another one that keeps turning up. Uh, very often in our area, stuff is coming out of nurseries. They're very, very tiny oyster shell scale shaped scale insects. They can be super duper heavy on the bark of a tree. Um, have a look when you're seeing, uh, again, we'll see them on maples. They've got a very, very broad host range. We'll talk about host range in just a minute here. Um, the problem with these guys, they're really small, so they're often missed, and they have a super long crawler period. We've got two generations, but those generations are overlapping. So you may have to do multiple, if you're doing a kind of a, a IGR wet spray or an oil spray, you're gonna have to have multiple applications to put a beat down on this, okay? Here in Maryland, uh, we're definitely getting two generations in Maryland, Virginia. Uh, some people have said one generation in, in parts of PA. Um, I can't verify that. Here in Maryland, I know, and in Virginia, we definitely have two. Okay, here's the problem, gang, look at this. 
So you can have canopy dieback and symptoms in this giant list of plants, and it could be related to Japanese maple scale. 13 family, 16 genera. Um, that's now been expanded, doubled almost uh, 45 genera of plants as we learn more about it. So it seems to be more and more common. Here's what the symptom is gonna be. Again, these are maples planted in front of our Comcast center. Here's what the bark looks like. The bark's not supposed to look like this gang. Look at the densities of scales on this tree. And that's why we're seeing die back. They're just taking such a toll on the vascular systems. Two generations. Now, I want to get right to this. Um, I'm going to show you some, some uh, pictures here. I, I don't want to belabor the point. You can certainly put up double-sided tape to see when the crawlers are active. So you need to time out your crawlers. No question about that. We can use in plant phenological indicators, PPI. I'll show you those in just a minute. Okay. So for our flowering plant indicators, our phen plant phenology, we're gonna see first generation crawlers just about when the Chinese lilac and the smoke tree are in bloom. Your second generation and stewardia, you're gonna see your second generation crawlers when devil's walking stick, Aurelia spinosa, is blooming. So first generation is gonna be here, Second generation here, if you use PPIs. If we look at this on a more degree day level or seasonality, we had our peak emergence here at about 1,200 growing degree days. The second one at about 32, uh, 30, uh, yeah, 3,200, 31, 39. But that's putting first generation here in Maryland and uh, Northern Virginia right around the second week of June and our second generation right about in here. Okay, so that's what you wanna look for. That's what you're gonna time your sprays out for. Okay. Uh, you can go to the... Um, the IPM website, our newsletter always uh, has information on the appearance of these uh, different scale insects when we see them. So that's a really good resource. There's also a phenological calendar you can find through a Maryland Cooperative Extension, and that'll help you time out these crawler sprays for some of these different uh, armored scales and soft scales I've talked about. There's a lot of species of parasites that attack them. But again, uh, in many cases, especially in the built environment, these guys don't seem to hold them down. Some good materials, we have growth regulators, talus, buprofessin. Uh, this is one we use, as I said, proxide, a nice growth regulator. We can use our horticultural oils. And again, on the trees where we're not concerned with our pollinators, with the, the uh, non-target effect, Again, Altus, Flupyratiferone, and Lepitect Asaphate probably are also going to help put these guys down. Insecticidal soaps, again, oops, that's pine needle scale. Let's back that one up for a minute. These seem to want to jump ahead, but even Dinotefuran, again, because it's on a green tissue, remember, your Dinotefuran is going to move up into those pine needles and give you good control. Here's another one. Again, this is your transect. Okay. Nice levels of control against pine needle scale, systemic moving up into the needles, killing those things. Here's another one, gloomy scale. Okay. As a soil injection or a bark spray. I think this was probably done by Steve Frank down at NC State, gloomy scale. Again, taken up, killing those guys on the bark of the tree. And a similar study done by these guys. Here's your Dinotefuran. Let's get back there. This is on an automatic guy, sorry. Here's your Proxite, your pyri pyri pro Proxifen plus horticultural oil, a double up, and giving us nice levels of control. Japanese maple scale, again, your Proxite, good levels of control up to 90 days out, looking nice. 
And here's one uh, that I worked on here. I found that in this case, our merit was not giving good levels of control. This again on Japanese maple scale, but things like our safari and our arena, our dinotefuran given us very nice levels of control. Um, same thing here. This is uh, elongate hemlock scale on hemlocks. Here's your horticultural oil and your pyriproxifen distance or proxite giving us nice levels of control on elongate hemlock scale. Okay. Flupiratiferone, I've uh, talked about this a couple of times. Here's a little more information. It's got a big label, lots of sucking insects. Uh, it's compatible with beneficials, which is nice. That's what's kind of put it into the reduce risk EPA category. Okay, so it's got a mode of action similar to the Neonex, but it's got a better profile against the pollinators. Uh, I've talked about this a lot today, a nice insect growth regulator, good for white flies and mealybugs, as well as your scale insects. Okay, again, more information. Here's euonymus scale control. Here's false oleander scale control on Southern Magnolia. Here's gloomy scale control. So again, a very, very good tool uh, against these different scale insects. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip this one again for sake of time. Now, places where you can get information and uh, you should have access to this. This is our um, woody plant. Host lists are found at our extension bullet bulletin at this link. Um, you can also get more information from this one. It talks about the biology and management of Japanese maple scale. So good resources that talk about this problematic scale insect. Very briefly, I'm running out of time. I'm seeing that I'm, I'm about, uh, you know, 10 minutes up from my hour. Uh, so I'm going to try to push through these next ones pretty quickly. These are kind of, I would say, more or less less important. These are a little oddball scales. Uh, the pit making scales, we see them on holly from time to time, the astrolocanids. They form these, they kind of kill the tissue beneath it. The plant grows up and around it, so it kind of looks like it's in a pit. One generation a year, uh, there are, for this particular one, uh, I see it primarily on ilex um, and oak is where I see most of the pit making scales, but they do have other hosts. Here's the golden oak scale, all right, this is what this one's going to look like, okay, they form pits on the oak branches. And in this particular test, I found that applications, uh, these were mostly synthetic pyrethroids that I was applying to these plants. I found that the neonic really didn't give us good control of these things, but the synthet synthetic pyrethroids were giving me excellent control of pit making scales. Now we're gonna bump over to the felt scales, the aerococcid scales. These have, uh, they're usually a larger scale than our armored scales. The adults are covered with this kind of smooth, waxy, it looks like felt, hence the name uh, felt scales. They are phloem feeders. So with these guys, you're also going to get that honeydew and sooty mold. And you're going to see those ant trails that I talked about before. Some of them can have one or two generations. We believe that, that um, the one that's going to get on your crepe myrtle, though, in the South, that can have as many or four or five generations. So depending on where you are, that particular one's going to be more problematic. Now, as I said, we're all pretty familiar with the Zellia bark scale. Frankly, I don't really see this as a super common pest in the landscape. Uh, we'll see the first generation of crawlers, the Ovisax in May through June. We'll get a second generation later in the year. On our elm trees, sometimes we'll get the European elm scale. This is a one generation a year pest with your crawlers basically active in May, okay? We often find them on the bark, usually associated with twigs and branches. Ladybird beetles love to feed on these things. Now the new one, the new kid on the block is this one. This is the crepe myrtle bark scale. We plant a lot of crepe myrtle in this neck of the woods now. 
It's a native to Asia. It was to first detected in Texas back in 2004. It's been moving steadily westward and northward. We first found it in Maryland uh, two years ago in 2020. It's probably being moved with nursery stock from place to place. The females produce this white wax. If you bust them open, you're gonna find these pink insects underneath. It's highly diagnostic, all right? The crawlers uh, are also going to be uh, pink when you smush those guys. I'm not recommending you do that, but it's kind of fun. You could. Uh, their densities can be enormous on these trees. They're going to cause dieback. There's going to be a ton of honeydew and sooty mold. Really problematic when the densities get this high. Uh, be careful if you've had recent shipments of crepe myrtles from southern nurseries. Have a good look before you install those things or when they get on site. You want to check them out very, very carefully, your new installations, and get on top of this as quickly as you can. In terms of biological control, those ladybird beetles I talked about do attack and kill the scale. Uh, my buddy Pete Schultz down at Hampton Road said he's seen the skimness beetles come in and put down an infestation of these things uh, on crepe myrtles. I've heard arborists say they're using mechanical control where they gently wash these things or prune out heavily infested branches. Or if you have young trees that are heavily infested, you simply might want to remove and replace, control the nearby populations, but get those heavily infested trees out of there. Your IGRs are going to work well. Again, your pyriproxifen is a good material distance, your proxite, your talus. But again, you're going to have to target your crawlers. And we know we're going to have at least two generations here. So keep an eye on this. Try to target your crawlers. Are you going to be able to use your neonex? No, probably not so much because you're going to have pollinators coming into your crepe myrtles. Uh, of course, if you want to go after your crawlers with horticultural oils or soap, your timing has to be good and your coverage has to be good. The one last one I'm going to just show very briefly. Frankly, this is a bigger problem west of here. I hear my buddies out in the Midwest see the Kermeset scales, gold like scales on oak, much more common. They do produce honeydew one generation a year here with eggs that hatch in July. So if you did have an oak tree with these guys, you try to target your, your crawlers when you see them. Okay, kind of as a wrap up, we're closing things up here. Number one, identify your type of scale. Absolutely. Identify your host. Is it an armored scale, soft scale pit maker? Learn how to recognize your crawlers in particular. That's what you're going to tar target. That's what you're going to time those applications to of your growth regulators, your contact materials. You want to target the crawlers. It's going to be different for everyone. Have an eye out. See if give it the, the, the skin test with your thumb. Flip some covers. See if it's an active infestation or not. See if you got natural enemies in there. In some cases, those scales may be dead already. Cut back on your high nitrogen fertilizers. Get the scales off the plant first. Once the scales are done, now go ahead and add slow release, add your products, your soil amendments after the scales are done. If you put nitrogen on when the scales are there, they're gonna lay twice as many eggs. That's as simple as that. And then of course, do your follow-ups to make sure you have efficacy, okay? So Patrick, Mark, nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me back to talk about scale insects. This has been recorded, I think, so the guys and gals can go back and listen to this, I hope. Pick up on some of those, those websites that I had to rush through a little bit. Come visit our IPM report. It's a great resource here in the Mid-Atlantic. It comes out every week uh, on a Friday. There'll be a new report from the folks like yourselves that are inputting what they're seeing, degree day, stuff like that. So try to get the IPM net uh, landscape report. If you don't know how to get that, you can email me and uh, I'll, I'll share that link with you. Okay. Excellent. Do we have time for questions, uh, Mark. Are we out? So yeah, if if you guys need to leave, uh, you will get credit. I did put the course code into the chat for your reference. 
Mike, if you have a few minutes for questions, we do have a few good ones. It's up to you. Yeah, absolutely. No, you got me, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not Excellent. doing anything else this afternoon except hanging out and uh, I'd be happy to answer as many questions as you got. Great. I'm going to real quick. Um, Let me get rid of the uh, stop screen. Do we need, can I, should, should I do the stop share? Yeah. And uh, I'm going to go through a couple of things real quick. I mean, a couple of minutes and then we will, uh, we'll get to some questions here. So, okay. Um, just uh, as a reference for y'all, we do have, uh, there's, there's, we talked a lot about, we talked about all, I think, of the Eastern region scales. However, I did see there were some questions from Minnesota and other areas of the United States. So if you do have questions on those scales, we have webinars coming up in the future to address them, as well as we have these treatment guides available. And if you're interested in getting these treatment guides, which will give you a little bit of information about the actual scale, as well as treatment options and timing, um, please reach out to either myself or your territory manager or our tech support line. Anybody, any of those people can get you this information. We also have a scale insect management guide that will be available for download. And I think that'll be sent out in the follow-up email. And that's all I got. So we can get to some questions here and let me pull them up. Um, we had a question about Altus and whether that was a soil drench or a foliar spray for landscape applications. It's a good question. And to tell you, to tell you the truth, uh, I pulled down my presentation. Let me go back uh, to that and see if I can pick it off. Um, let me get back to Altus. I know up the top, I've, I've got a feeling that it's probably that Altus is probably going on. It's both systemic and translaminar. Uh, so, Mark, I'm believing that probably it can go in. I would have to look at the label, but certainly it can go in as a foliar. Uh, whether or not it can go in as a soil drench, yeah, it says as a drench. So, yeah, it's going to do both. And we're seeing a lot of our nursery gardens in particular switching over and liking the Altus because it fits into that reduced risk category. So it's of kind of a different level. It's not OMRI, it's not organic, but it's just the next cut below that. Good question. Uh, we have a question around um, injecting Imaget for Magnolia scale after bloom. And they have found that it's giving them three to four years of control does this mean that that imidacloprid is present in is present for blooming in the following two to three seasons? Yep, pretty sure. I have not seen data on this, uh, particularly from Magnolia. I'd have to go back and look at my references on this, but I'd be reasonably sure that there have been enough other systems now. Uh, we well. You know, a cotoneaster is not a magnolia, but we found with the midacloprid, we were seeing a carryover effect for three seasons with uh, a midacloprid on cotoneaster. So I think the answer to this is, is yes. And I'm only saying this, gang, because... Um, you know, from a, a, a kind of a, a safety concern, a public relations concern, you know, if you were to treat a tree and then have a bee kill, you know, the following season or something like this, this could result in some kind of action. Uh, I'm pretty sure that bee warning box now, the bee warning uh, label is, or box is on most labels, or I think all labels now, of things like imidacloprid and dinotefuran. So um, my belief is yes, and I would kind of try to find a different way to get around it. I understand where you're coming from uh, with a long period of activity, but maybe try one of these other, you know, uh, are these small magnolias? I, I guess I'm gonna uh, ask a different question. Are these big trees or little trees? Uh, that was specified, see if I can find that answer. Um, Probably what we could do is, is follow up afterwards. Right. With that. Um, well, that was David. Yeah, we could follow up afterwards with okay. that. Okay. Um, but again, if, if these are little trees, you know, I would think it's certainly within a single season or maybe two seasons. If you were to come in with your proxy, your IGRs, 
and time that uh, for those crawlers. I would think in a couple years, maybe two years, you could settle that if it was a small tree. If it's a large tree, uh, kind of my word on this tree is that, you know, the Lepitect is given nice control of uh, hard to control scale insects in places where we think we have resistance to the neonicotinoids like European elm scale out in Colorado. I think the arborists out there are switching over to Lepitect and finding that the acephate is given nice control of those guys. So it's just another consideration. Um, you know, if it's a small tree and you can get in there with your contact material, it's not too tight. So you're, you're not worrying about a neighbor or something like that, you know, give that a shot. And if it's a different situation, you might want to try another, a different kind of systemic, right? You might want to try your flu pyratophorone or your altus or something like that, right? Or your left detect. Yeah. Excellent. Um, does extreme honeydew prevent photosynthesis? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is a question I always had. And I finally, I finally got off my butt and, uh, and started checking this out. There have been a couple studies I could find in the literature. One actually was with the, the aphid, they call it the beach blight aphid, not the beach bark aphid. It's also called the boogie woogie aphid or the beach woolly aphid. If you've ever seen a beech tree and the limbs are coated white with these woolly aphids and they kind of wiggle when you bo bar bother them, they dance like do a boogie woogie. They make so much honeydew that it actually suppresses the growth of plants below them. Uh, I think I've seen one other reference where they find that when you, those leaves I showed you that are pure black, it's got to be reducing the photosynthetic capacity of those leaves. So in addition to, the other thing I did not talk about with the honeydew, and we're going to see it with lanternfly, that's, that's another talk we'll have to give. There is so much honeydew, and you'll also see it on Burfords, you'll see it on these crepe myrtles. There's so much honeydew, they're gonna attract stinging insect, bees and wasps. And if you have clients that have a bee or wasp aller allergy, this can become a serious situation. So in addition to the sooty mold growth, whenever we have tons of this honeydew, it, you know, it's gonna rain down on picnic tables, on vehicles, but it also is gonna attract stinging insects. And you know, it, it's, it's good to try to get those things off of there if you can for those reasons, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although the best time to apply horticultural oil is on the crawlers, is it effective at all on the humped up scale? So I guess the adults. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, the efficacy data, I'd have to look back in my references on this. Uh, I think once they're humped up, if we're talking about soft scales, yeah, your efficacy is going way down. And same thing, um, boy, I didn't put it in this talk, but I saw a paper, it was a timing paper just like this. And uh, it was with pyroproxifen now, it wasn't with oil. But anyway, yeah, I think your your efficacy is going to go way down once your scale, if it's an armored scale, once they have that waxy layer, if it's a soft scale, once they've begun to hump up, your efficacy is going to be much lower than when you have a nymph that hasn't really put that waxy cover on yet. So I, the answer, short answer is probably yes, your efficacy is going to go way down um, with your with your oil. Um, will you still kill some? I don't know the answer to that, but my guess is yes, uh, particularly on soft scales or maybe on your area coxin scales, your felt scales. I would think that oil would still have some activity, but not nearly as great as it would on your crawlers. Yeah. And, and uh, Dave, I saw you, we're referencing, we're, we're talking about uh, just our standard horticultural oil. Um, I think that was, you, you put a comment in there. Uh, let's see. This is a lot of great info. Is there a reference manual you recommend? I know you mentioned, uh, I guess if you want to plug the uh, University of Maryland Extension website, that's an excellent, I mean, there's all kinds of resources on there. 
Yeah, well, you know, I've looked over your scale, your scale bulletin, guys, and, you know, that's a super tool. I mean, for what you guys are doing, that's a very, you know, a very comprehensive and very handy uh, reference that you can use to so probably solve 80 or 90 percent of your problems, I think. So, no, great reference yeah. you guys have done. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to give a shameful uh, promotion for uh, my landscape manual. Uh, you know, I, there's a, uh, it's called Managing Insects on Mites and Woody Landscape Plants. And it, we cover about 250 of the most common uh, insect and mite problems in there, including scale insects with generations and timing and material. So there are lots and lots of good references out. Your, your extension people in every state practically have a great bulletin. You guys have developed a great tool, uh, great resources on your website. So, you know, I think, I think it's all right there. There are entire books written on scale insects. Um, things like Armored Scale has a, an entire volume that's this thick about scale insects that my colleague John Davidson wrote. But I think the other manuals we've talked about here would be fine. The newsletters that go out, you're going to be OK. Going to yeah. be OK. Lots of good references. Uh, let's see here. Um... Best time to control Kermie's scale. I want to say most of these one generation rascals, usually, you know, my, my gut is always Mayish, Juneish, but let me see. No, a little bit later on Kermie's, it's the one on the one on Oak. Okay. This one says the eggs are going to hatch in July. So these are a little bit later. Uh, I'm sure this timing is what we pulled out of our IPM guidebook. So overwinter is first instar. So they're going to be humping up in the springtime. Eggs hatching in July. So this one's going to be a little bit later than our soft scales. Remember, our soft scales are going to be in that May to June window, right? Most of those uh, soft scales. These ones are going to be in July. So great question. Thanks for bringing me back to this slide. And that's when I'd be looking for them. Mid to late, probably mid to late July, you want to get out there and start looking. Although if we have a hot year, you might want to be out there early July. Excellent. Good question. Uh, just, a, uh, just a couple more. Uh, in the fall, when the soft scale migrate back to the bark, can an oil be applied to the bark for control or is there anything else? You know, that's a good question. Again, once they've, once those crawlers have moved out and they're done feeding, um, uh, you know, the dormant sprays, you know, we used to have two windows for dormant. Some people would put on a dormant spray as things kind of wound down in the autumn before we had, uh, you know, freezing temperatures, you know, temperatures down certainly in the 50s and things like that would be perfectly fine, probably, uh, if you wanted to go with a dormant spray. Uh, or again, in the spring, once uh, the season starts to kick in a little bit. And I, I have not seen data on this, but my guess would be there probably would be nothing wrong with trying to intercept those uh, crawlers as they move off the leaves and before they settle down uh, and get ready for winter. Yeah, I, I, I've never done it. I haven't seen data on it, but there's no reason to expect that wouldn't work. Gang, the other piece of the puzzle here, remember now, once you have that scale insect, like an oplicanium feeding on a leaf tissue, right? You can move systemics into that leaf tissue. So again, you've got a wind pollinated plant here, uh, you know, systemics into that green tissue on the leaf is going to kill those, those scales during the summer months. And so I'm thinking big trees, they're going to be hard to get a wet spray, right? Get a conventional spray to the top of you could put a systemic in there. Like I would think Lepitec would be dynamite. You know, acephate is a really good, um, you know, sucking insect material. So there could be other things to think about in some of these tall trees that are going to be hard to treat with your IGRs or things like that. 
So thinking out of the box a little bit wouldn't hurt, but why not? Give it a try. If you have a place you could do this, give it a try and see what it looks like. Yeah. Tinker. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, we do have, there's two more questions that are kind of towards uh, us here though. Okay. Uh, are there any other upcoming ISA CEU opportunities as well as do we have an agenda for future trainings? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. So if you go to our website, which I just have up here at rainbowecoscience.com, go to the education tab and click events. That will bring you and that will give you a list of all of our up upcoming webinars remaining for the spring. Uh, we do these series uh, usually twice a year. So keep an eye out on the website for any other future webinars. Um, but there are still quite a few coming up uh, this spring still. Um, with that, I would like to thank you, Mike, for spending the time with us. Lots and lots of awesome, just great inf 